Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Dune, The Battle of Corrin by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this is book number three in the Machine trilogy. Um, I don't know if it says what the... Oh, the prelude to Dune, I guess, this trilogy. Oh no, Legends of Dune 3. There we go. So I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs as I go, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Legends of Dune 3. Humanity can still win if it can make the final sacrifice, the Battle of Corrin. The universal computer mind Omnius has retreated to its last stronghold, where it plots a devastating new strategy that could undo the victories of the Butlerian Jihad. The surviving Titans are creating new lieutenants to do their will when at last they return to attack the human beings they once ruled. In the years of peace, too many of mankind have forgotten that their machine enemies never sleep. But on the windswept desert planet Arrakis, the power that can give them victory waits. The authors of Prelude to Dune have written the triumphant climax to the history of the Dune universe, the story most eagerly anticipated by its readers. So one thing I learned here, which I didn't know, so Frank Herbert, who created Dune, obviously passed away in 86, he was a professional photographer, journalist, and occasional oyster diver. He also had stints as a radio news commentator and jungle survival instructor. What a badass. And I thought this was clever, so the Cymex have created Neo Cymex, so um, it's basically like half machine, half people, and they've created these neo cymex to, to go under them, but they've built in this sort of failsafe to make sure that they never rebel, so... neo cymex have been created from the enslaved populace on Riches and, Be on Riches and Bella Tegiz, Beetlejuice, whatever. Precise surgery detached volunteer brains from frail human forms and installed them in mechanical walkers. Ever wary and vigilant, the Titans ensured their converts' loyalty by installing dead man switches into all their life support systems that would cause them to break down if the Titans died. Even the Neos on other Cymec planets, far from here, had to receive a reset signal at least once every two years or else they would perish. If the General and his two companions were assassinated, all of the neo Cymex would eventually succumb. It not only prevented betrayal, but also fostered in them a fanatical desire to protect Agamemnon, Juno and Dante. Very clever, I like that. So most of the Dune books have got these quotes, in fact all of them I think, have got these quotes at the start of the chapters which add a little bit of extra context and sometimes you get a really good one like this one. Uh, Raquel Alberto Anirul, Assessments of Philosophical Revelations. Those who have everything value nothing. Those who have nothing value everything. So a quote here I wanted to share, this is from Theo Holtzman, Acceptance Speech for Service to Poetry and Award. There is a certain hubris to science, a belief that the more we learn about technology and develop it, the better our lives will be. And that's kind of the um, underlying story between like, the war between men and machines. A quote from Raina Butler, True Visions. I didn't like Raina Butler. I mean, she was a good character, I just didn't like her on like a personal level or what she believes in. Technology has a seductive nature. We assume that advances in this realm are always improvements, beneficial to humans. We are deluding ourselves. Now, I think that's kind of quite relevant to, to our own world, you know? My cat's right behind the camera showing me his arse. It's very distracting. A quote here from Abulard Harkonnen, Journal of the Last Days of Seleucia Secundus. He said, We may die tomorrow, but we must hope today. Though it will not extend our lives, at least it will make them more meaningful. And again, I think that's something that we can all live by. You know, we never know when our time's gonna come. And we get these, this new assault from the robots. They're kind of trapped on uh, Corin. And um, yeah, they come up with the, these things that are like, I don't know what you'd call them. They're like little mini robots that fly through the air and strip everything, basically. Um, and so we get this little bit, which I just thought was well written and, you know, pretty terrifying. Vor's brow furrowed. Give the order to fire, but don't expect it to be that easy. Omnius undoubtedly built in numerous protective systems. He gestured with one hand. However, the sooner we know what those defences are, the faster we can find ways to circumvent them. A barrage of artillery shells pounded outward in short arcs, flying point-blank toward the nearest factory pit. As the explosives dropped towards the target, clouds of piranamite swirled like smoke around the open production mouth. The voracious devices clustered together as if they could form a barricade against the infalling projectiles. Hordes of mites connected to each other with sticky interfaces, clustering into various shapes, setting up large obstructions. Then the mite clusters homed in on each incoming shell like mechanical leeches. They dismantled the shells in mid-air, ripping them to tiny scraps of metal which they delivered into the factory moor where the raw materials were broken down and converted into more of the killer units. Without direct orders, one foolhardy mercenary swooped over the vicinity in a small armoured flyer and the machine mites targeted him. Thousands of the flying devices clumped along his flyer's hull where they began stripping away the metal, the seals, the electronic systems. 
As a last gesture, the mercenary managed to drop only one of his explosives. The projectile tumbled down and detonated in the air before the mites could dismantle it entirely. The shockwave merely stirred up the furious mites and caused little damage. The mercenary's fighter broke apart. For a moment, the doomed man fell free, flailing in the air, and then the piranha machine zeroed in and ripped him to shreds. He was dead before the tattered remnants of his body struck the ground. Brutal. All right, so a quote from Erasmus here in The Mutability of Organic Forms. Successful creative energy involves the harnessing of controlled madness. I am convinced of this. As a creative myself, I can kind of see that. Uh, Tlaloc in A Time for Titans, he says, The god of science can be an unkind deity. And a another Christianity text here, a disputed translation. Death can be a friend, but only if he comes calling at the right time. And I'm not going to go into spoilers, but that one was a particularly apt quote. I mean, all of these quotes tie back in with what's going on in the story at the time. But that one tied in really well, I thought. Another quote from Rainer Butler, Sermons on Salus Secundus. The greatest of mankind's criminals are those who delude themselves into thinking they have done the right thing. And we all know that to be true. You can see that with Putin at the moment. Although whether he actually believes his own propaganda, who knows. Anyway, Bashar Abilad Harkonnen uh, from his private journals. Justice may be impartial, but righteousness is deeply personal. All right, and here is uh, the manifesto of Rainer Butler. And I'm going to read this out in full. And this will explain to you why I didn't like her. Um, citizens of free humanity, let it be proclaimed throughout the League of Nobles that there are no benign uses for thinking machines. Though they may conceal their evil under the guise of performing work-saving tasks for their users, they are insidious at any level. This manifesto is a blueprint by which human society can cleanse itself of the worst sins. Every League citizen shall adhere to these rules and be bound by these punishments. If a person knows the location of a thinking machine and does not destroy it or report it to the movement, the offender shall be punished by the removal of his eyes, ears and tongue. If a person commits the grievous sin of using a thinking machine, he should be put to death. If a person commits the even more grievous sin of owning a thinking machine, he should be put to death by the most painful of means. If a person commits the worst sin of all, creating or manufacturing a thinking machine, the offender, all of his employees and all of their families shall be put to death by the most painful of means. Anyone in doubt as to what constitutes a dangerous machine shall contact the movement and request an official opinion. Once an official opinion has been rendered, the offending machine shall be removed from operation and destroyed immediately. Punishments will be administered as specified above. It is preferable to manufacture products through slave labour than to trust thinking machines. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. And then we have a quote here from Mao Tse Tung, a, philosoph a philosopher of old earth. I thought that was Chairman Mao. Hey Google, who was Mao Tse Tung? Yeah, so that is Chairman Mao. Um, so he... I understood. It's no! Chairman Mao. Is that right? Okay Google, stop. So yeah. Me? How can I help? Stop! Okay, so Mao Zedong uh, is not a philosopher, he was uh, a mass murderer. Uh, and then the machines have made like a clone of Serena Butler, and Vorian Atreides has to watch as she's killed again, which is just rough. And um, we learn that the Carino family get their names because of the Battle of Corin, essentially. It's really nicely done, so the ending of this really ties together all of the different bits. So we get, for example, from this day forth, let all who bear the name of Atreides spit on the name of Harkonnen. And so it just again, it sets up really nicely why the state of everything was as it was when the Dune books, the original series started. Um, I also like this little line here. Um, he had lived two human lifetimes so far and might easily have more than that remaining in his supercharged genes. He had begun to show faint signs of ageing. He looked 30 at the most. But in his bones, in his very soul, he carried the fatigue of a thousand years. Same, man. Same. So yeah, all in all, The Battle of Corin by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. It's probably the weakest of all of the Herbert and Anderson collaborations I've read so far. Um, but having said that, I am still going to stick to the series and keep reading them. Not least because I'm most of the way through now. I'm probably three quarters of the way through all of the Dune books. Um, total so that's kind of cool but yeah it was okay the ending the last 50 pages of it or so basically the end of the machine war the butlerian jihad would it was kind of too easy it felt too easy um but i did really like the way it set up what came next in terms of the june books and i'm again i'm gonna read more i gave it a 3.5 out of 5 so there we have it, that's what I made of The Battle of Corin by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.